All right, hopefully this is working. Can you guys hear it? I can't even see you. I don't know where you're at. Oh, live now. Yeah, it says it's live. Say something. There's two other people in here. There's two. I think it's you guys. Well, hi, Laura Siegert. Hi, Dana. <laughs> I don't know if the microphone's picking up. Okay. So someone ask a question. Introduce yourself, please. Oh, hi. This is John from Branson Saracote and Laser. You already get a discount, Brad. This is the first one of these we've done, so I have no idea how this is going to work. Uh, we didn't even know until about five minutes ago if it was going to work at all. Hey, David. Uh, we're hoping those are going to be available. We're talking about the Mylar stencils within the next maybe two weeks. Um, we're waiting on our distributor to be able to ship the sheets to us so that we can start cutting them. We've already got. I don't know, probably five or 10 new designs. And then we've got all of our existing ones that we're going to do in the Mylar. For those of you that have called in and talked to us, by the way, Laura is the graphic artist in our shop and she is also my wife. So if you need something done, she is definitely the one to talk to. I'll let Laura ask, uh, answer that question because I get yelled at when I say, oh, we can do any kind of stencil. Uh, as far as the uh, the clear coat, few things. One, I, I would probably tell you not to use the H series. The H series has all kinds of issues. Even Cerakote will tell you not to use the the clear coat over Cerakote. And what I've heard is they're talking mainly about the H series. The problem with the H series is that you you have to treat it like a final color in your project. So you have to tack everything out, and then that clear coat ends up being your final color. When you put that in the oven, if you've maybe tacked your, your initial base coat a little too much, then that clear coat won't adhere where that initial base coat is and it flakes off. So what we do is we use the MC-156 or 157, which is the clear coat, uh, the, the air dry clear coat. 
and it just gives you, you know, it, it adheres to everything. You don't have to worry about it because your base coat, all of your coats are, are already hard baked, so it doesn't really matter. The only downside is you've got to let it just sit for seven days. As far as the runs and things, um, another thing that Serica doesn't do a very good job of putting the information out, I guess, is that you need to let that, uh, you need to spray that at 30 PSI, not 20. And the other thing is you're not spraying it directly on your project, so to speak, as far as you're not letting the air project it directly on your surface. What you need to do is set your fan up as wide as it'll go and then set your volume up to get a really good, like dense cloud and then back up about 18 inches. And you're just kind of throwing that mist at your project and it's going to fall where you need it. That takes care of the runs. And then, like I said, give it one good wet pass, set aside to ignore it for a week and then you're good to go. Let's see. Thank you, Knife Pro. I appreciate that. There's a, a lot of times doing this, we don't really have, um, we don't get a lot of feedback. Uh, we, we do get a lot of phone calls and emails, but it's there's times where it's hard to tell if we're you know, doing the things that people want to see. So if you've ever got any ideas, definitely shoot us an email or a text or something like that, and we'd be happy to try and knock something out for you. Oh, okay. So the MC-157, that's going to be your problem. Is going to be probably um, spraying too close and probably you know, possibly at the wrong pressure. So that 30 PSI is huge over the 20 and then just back up a little bit. Yeah, we actually got a phone call about, um, I don't know, two weeks ago, a guy had done a project and then put it back in the sandblast cabinet and kind of went back over and etched it again to put the clear coat on and, and it, I'd never even heard of doing that. I guess it's common in some other industries when you're putting clear coat over it. And it, he's, he showed me a picture of it. It was, it was really bad. So with the Cerakote, just bake it hard, spray the clear on it, um, you know, set aside, don't, don't mess with it, leave it alone for the week. It'll be tacked out in about four hours, depending on time of year and how cold it is in your shop, things like that. Um, you'll be able to handle it within about four or five hours, but, you know, to get it all the way hardened out, you want to give it about a week. It's like Laura's getting more questions than I am. <laughs> the problem with the, the different uh, mixtures or the ratios, uh, I'll give you the story behind it. So when I went out to Cerakote five years ago, before I went out there, I, I was having issues and it was, you know, stumbling around trying to figure this whole process out. And one of them I was having was I would get, like scuff marks. It looked like you'd taken a pencil eraser and left scuff marks on the surface. So when I went out there, I asked them, I said, well, why am I getting this issue? So they kind of walk, okay, walk us through what you're doing. You know, why are you, what, are, how are you doing the process? So when I got to the part about the ratios, they were like, oh yeah, you know, you don't really want to mix it 18 or 24 because you can get those scuff marks, but you don't worry about it. You know, 12 to one, you won't have those issues. So I said, well, why are you telling people to mix them like this? Because, you know, my, my customer goes home, you know, pulls his gun back out of the holster and it's scuffed. He's not going to call you. He's going to call me. So they said, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's just gives people options. I said, well, it's not really a good option if it's going to leave scuff marks. So I've just, ever since it mixed 12 to one, I've never had that issue again. Um, and if someone wants a different sheen, then we just add clear coat to it. Let's see. Yep. The, any of the light colors the, or the brighter colors, the white, the robin's egg, um, hunter orange, yellows, pinks, things like that. That's another bit of that information that they used to have on their website and they, that's no longer there for some reason. Um, they used to have tech sheets on there for every color and you would go on there and click and it would say, you know, 250 max do not exceed 250 for some of these colors. Well, that information was never really put out. And that was another bit of information when I went out to the training, that's where they showed me Oh yeah. Hey, here's when you go over here. Cause I was the same way. I was like, why am I getting, you know, why is my white turning Brown when I bake it at 300 for an hour? And that's what they told me. So, but then suddenly a year or so, a year and a half ago, that information disappeared. So for me, unless I, I'm just doing black or elite, which has to be at 300 degrees, I bake everything 250 for two hours 
and you just don't have those issues. Um, something else to keep in mind when you're doing something like that too, if you if you kind of have to do things at a higher temp to get them done, if you do say a tattered flag where you've got a white base coat, blue, red, black, you're still limited to 250 for two because of that white base coat. Even though the other three colors can go 300 for an hour, that white limits you, so you're, you're kind of stuck uh, doing it for the 250 for two. Well, thanks, David. I really do appreciate that. It's, you know, this whole channel started from, you know, just we get a lot of phone calls and I've never minded talking to people. I always, you know, enjoy kind of interacting with people and helping them through problems. And the whole channel started because I would get the same kind of phone calls, some basic stuff. And I told my wife, I said, I just got to do maybe three or four little videos that cover some of the basics, put those up so that when I'm working and really can't invest a lot of time, I can say, hey, go check that video out. And if you still have questions, call me tonight. I'll be happy to talk to you, you know, and, and answer any further questions. And that led to, can you do one on this? You know, what about this project? What about this stencil? So it, it really kind of took off and led to a lot of other things. And, you know, now 170 some videos later, um, this channel's really taken off. I mean, it's, it's by no means a money maker for us. We don't really make any money at all off of, of YouTube because it is such a kind of a niche market for, for Cerakote. So it's not like some, you know, 500,000 subscriber thing. Uh, but it, it does allow us to interact with people. We've made a lot of really great friends. and We've gotten some tips back from people that say, you know, hey, this is probably the stupidest thing you've ever heard. But this is something I kind of started doing. And I'm like, wow, God, that's genius. So, you know, we steal from people all the time. Techniques, not money. Uh, let's see. And that was exactly it. Thank you, Laura. Um, the applicator training started because we had people that watched the videos and just want to know if we did it. And, you know, I never thought anyone would want to come to our shop and do training. Uh, you know, but Sarah you know, th they do very small classes. When you go out there, they train four people a week. It's two Monday, Tuesday and two Thursday, Friday. Um, it's you and one trainer. So it's one on one. It's very good training, but they are backed up almost two years. So you know, we did get a lot of interest in wanting to do training and, and we were happy to do that. And it, it does fill a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a gap in there for people that want to be doing it right for the, you know, right up front, but then go out there later and, and get into more of a, an advanced course with them. Let's see. Uh, damn it, Matthew, what do you mean by the firearm schematics? Um, Joseph, the, the, when you get that edge between coats, that's from spraying too heavy on your follow on coats. Your base coat is the only one that needs to be one mil. Once you air cure that, put it in the oven, tack it out, bring it out, let it cool, and you lay your stencils on, you only need to apply that next color and the third and fourth and fifth heavy enough to cover the color that's underneath, not the yellow of the stencil, just the color underneath. So the majority of the time, it's going to be a really quick coat. Um, also keep in mind that with some colors, you'll still kind of see a little bit of that color underneath through what you just sprayed. But once you hang on the rack to air cure it, it will actually level and cover that color up. So you don't want to go really heavy, go over it two or three times, because what happens is you build up next to the edge of that stencil. And then when you get to the end and you peel it, you get that ridge. And there's really no way to fix it. You've got to basically sand it down and, and redo it or live with it. So that's, that's kind of a technique and a practice thing. What I know I'll always tell people is, you know, get some pieces that you, you know, saw blades or things that you don't really care about that you can practice on and just practice those techniques before you put them on something that, you know, is going to, you're going to invest a lot of time and money in. Let's see. Do we upcharge for white? No, we just refuse to do it if it's solid. Um, I don't do solid white handguns anymore or, or solid white farms anymore just because um, even after doing this six and a half years later, um, white is just an absolute nightmare. And Stormtrooper, when they came out with that, fixed 80% of the problems of the other white that, you know, the, the four or five white colors that they had, but it still has issues. And I still have issues with it six and a half years later. So I just, as a, as a business person, I just don't take on white, pro you know, solid white projects anymore. If someone wants a Stormtrooper gun and, and wants to battle wear it, then I, there's some things I can do there to, if there is a slight imperfection or a thin area or whatever, I can I can go back and, and fix that. Um, but just doing solid white, especially on like a handgun where you have a steel slide and a polymer frame, 
it's almost impossible to make those match. So we just honestly turn those down. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, is this, is the, uh, Eric asked if the, the training out of Cerakote is worth it. What I tell people, especially when they come to our training, one of the things we talk about is do they still need to go out to Oregon? And the answer is, and in my opinion, yes, but you need to go out to Oregon to go to the factory training and look at it as what do I get from them? Not what are they going to give to me, I guess. So the three big advantages of going out and getting factory certified are you get to say you're factory certified. So that alone will bring business in. Um, benefit number two, you, you do get uh, free coding. So in the last six months, I've gotten probably $800 worth of free coding. So you, you got to kind of look at it from that direction too, is, you know, I'm going to get that. And then, you know, the third benefit is you do get a discount. So um, on the four ounce bottles only, you don't get it on the larger bottles. So we, we really don't buy a lot of four ounce, but when you do need some oddball color, you get 20% off of that. You also get 20% off of equipment, things like that. So there is some monetary, um, you know, considerations there and you will save enough money over a few years to pay yourself back for going to the training. So, you know, again, they're not, they're not going to do a lot for you. They're not going to send you business. They're not going to play you up. They're not going to send, you know, really make you into, you know, the big shop, but it's what can you take back from them to make it worth your while to go out there? I mean, it's an expensive trip. It's, it's, it's not cheap training and, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere, Oregon. So it costs a little bit to get out there and things like that, but it, it is, it's worth doing eventually. Um, you know, the, the one advantage I think for coming to our training is that, you know, we're going to get you in quicker and we're going to make sure you're not spraying incorrectly because that can ruin your business before you get off the ground. Um, a lot of people look at Cerakote as kind of a paint and they spray it like they do paint because they're worried about it running or they're worried about this or that. And it's not sprayed correctly. And that word gets out, especially with social media. So it can absolutely destroy your business before it gets off the ground. All right, let's see. Uh, good. Great that you got the Iwata, though. That That is the first thing I tell everyone to upgrade. Well, let's see. Yeah, um, Nigel, <laughs> it's funny. We got a, a call from a guy who's got a pretty big you know, YouTube channel about a month and a half ago. Um, and he, one of the things he told us was, man, I love your content, but your video sucks. So that was a little painful to hear, but I get it. And some of the tips he gave us were changing camera angles, getting a little bit closer. So we've bought some equipment, some things to to help out with that. And, the, and we've started kind of change of perspective. The last four or five videos we've put up uh, have been kind of back to the, the bad old ways, but there's been a reason for that. We've been working on a really big commercial project for a company I, that we can't release any details yet. They've been like, every time I talk to the, the, the person that we're dealing with from them, they hammer me about, we better not find anything on social media until they release it. Um, we're hopefully within a few days of being done with that. And once we are done and it all gets released, then we'll be able to, um, you know, kind of let everybody know. And we've got a video that we've been recording over the last few weeks to do that. Once we get beyond that, we'll be able to go back to doing a lot more of the fun stuff, a lot more of the in-depth things. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. But yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely work out some things to be able to get some more in you know, closer video and, and maybe do some more two or three video sets of one project. Um, we try to sprinkle those in every once in a while, but um, those seem to, for whatever reason, seem to not be quite as popular as like the tips and tricks and the the crazy top 10 list for some reason. But we will definitely work on some of those because those are the ones I enjoy being able to, to do a project from start to finish. Ah, my buddies at ATF speak of the devil. They're the ones that gave us the info about, uh, you know, changing camera angles and stuff. So, Thanks to them. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, if you're talking about closer for the, the live stream, man, I'm, 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 I'm trying. This is uh this has definitely been a, a learning experience. Um, as far as how to tell if you've coded one mil, uh, I'd recommend getting a thickness meter to start with. What that'll do is it, it's more of a, it, it's hard to explain to someone. There's no way for me to say, oh, well, when you see this, you've, you've gone to one mil. The best advice I can give you is, uh, you know, maybe check out the video we did on setting your, your gun up to begin spraying type of thing. And then practice going slow enough that you can actually kind of see the Cerakote layering up a little bit, um, you know, kind of, you know, spraying on there, not just like color going on, but the actual coating going on and, and becoming a little bit thick. 
and then overlapping that all the way around, bake it and then drop a meter on it. And you'll kind of get an idea of, do I need to go just a little bit slower or maybe a little bit faster? Um, and you'll probably find you're in about the 1.25 uh, range, which will be perfect. Um, going too fast, the stuff might as well not even be on there. You may have changed the color, but it's it's so thin, it's not. there's no durability there. So um, I can tell you out of the 200 or so people we've had come to training, um, none of them have been spraying correctly from the very beginning. Everyone has been really, really fast, really, really thin. So that's been probably the biggest thing that we've really slowed people down. Um, and a lot, my, most of the time when we get in the booth the first day and I show them how I spray, it freaks people out a little bit. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe you spray that slowly. But you know, that's that one of the big things we hammer on people from the very beginning is don't think of this as a paint, it's a coating. Um, it doesn't act like paint. It, it's, it's a whole different animal and you've got to spray it differently than probably what, you know, you're used to if you've rattle canned or, or even sprayed automotive paint. It's it's completely different than all that. Let's see. So uh, air pressure, I spray everything at 20 PSI except for the clear coat, which is 30 PSI. That also includes gun candy, which we, we really haven't dabbled that much in lately because um, we've been having issues. That's also at 30, obviously, and then Elite Series. Elite Series is a completely different animal. It has to be sprayed at 30 PSI. You have also a difference between pressure at the gauge and, and operating pressure. So if you set your gauge at 20 PSI, as soon as you crack that uh, trigger open, you're going to be spraying at about 16 or 17 PSI. So what you need to do, what I do anyway, is I have a high-pressure blow-off gun after my spray gun on my manifold. So I can crack that one open and adjust my air gauge at the wall to be right at 20 PSI operating. Then when I let it off, it bumps up to about 23 PSI or whatever. And then I know when I go to, you know, get to the Iwata and start spraying, I'm going to be dead at 20. You'll notice if you play around with pressure a little bit that the difference between even 20 and about 23 PSI, you will burn through coating at 23 PSI at about probably 30 or 40% faster than at 20 PSI. So you'll start running out on projects. And you're like, why am I running out? And then you go over and start looking at your pressure and you're like, oh, I was just a little high, but it'll blast through. So at 20, it seems like a really good pressure. It gives you a, a little more forgiveness and it also will um, not use your coating as much. So 20s, 20s is the sweet spot where you want to be. Let's see. Um, the training, uh, to answer Eric's question, uh, the training is $2,000 for three days. That $2,000 includes you and two other people. Um, so if you want to go in with some buddies or if you've got other employees, there, there's no additional cost for the other two people. Um, the training classes do not, um, we don't book multiple groups. So when you come, it's your group only. So whether it's you, two people or three, um, that's the only people we train. We, we run a Monday through Wednesday. Um, and we cover, we start out covering the basics, you know, paperwork, making sure you have an FFL, you know, your IA and D book, things like that. We, we talk about equipment and why what we have is what we recommend. You know, we, we talk about, you know, if you've already got equipment, the pros and cons of what you have, that type of thing. Um, and prep. Then normally, sometimes late that afternoon, the first day or early the, the second day, we start spraying. So we get everybody spraying correctly. Then we, we talk about tacking out, um, you know, air curing and then tacking out because tacking out is probably the second biggest thing that people have issues with. And tacking out is huge if you're going to do any kind of multiple color things. After we get kind of those things down and maybe some stenciling tips and things, it's wide open. It's whatever you want to know. You know, if you've got a picture of a gun, you want to know how they did it. What We talk about all that. So it's not really structured as much as once we get the basics down. It's whatever you want to do, whatever you want to know. We're willing to teach you all that. Um, as far as the things we give you for coming to training, we do provide lunches. We provide a $300 stencil pack. Everybody gets a t-shirt and we provide a tumbler for everyone to do in training because tumblers are a good way to make some money, at least in the beginning. Um, you do kind of price your way out of them as you get busier. It's They're just not as much meat on the bone to do ones and twos, uh, but they are a good way to practice and they're a good way to make some money up front. So we, we do talk about prepping and the differences in those. Um, we talk about Oakley's and things like that. 
Um, we do not provide transportation. We do not provide hotels. We don't provide breakfast and dinner. But other than that, you know, we, we drive you to lunch. We provide the lunch and everything like that. Did I forget anything, Laura? The Rogue Chef. Oh, one of the lunches is at the Rogue Chef, which is owned by some friends of ours. And it's the best restaurant in town. So they'll be open June 1st, but we've already eaten there. So we know it's the best one in town. All right. Uh, let's see. Scroll back up here. If the new firearm, if a new firearm comes in, you aren't sure how to disassemble it. Fuck your specs. Oh well. You're welcome. Yeah, the thing with disassembly and reassembly, I'm not a gunsmith, so I, you know, one, I don't want to take the liability, and two, it, to be completely honest. Even at a hundred dollar bench fee, if we want to charge that, there's some of these guns may take you three or four hours to to put back together because you just don't know how to do it. You got to kind of work your way through it. That's time that you're not making money. When you get to a certain point where you have a lot of volume coming through, you're not making money if you're not working on something that's going to make you money, and that's not one of them. So we're a Serico shop. We're not a gunsmith. We're not a gun shop. You know that's that part of that process is is you know honestly it's not our responsibility. So. When we first switched over and started doing it that way, we thought, well, we're going to lose business, but it was just the opposite. Most people are like, oh, okay, I understand that. So what we normally recommend to our customers is find a gunsmith. They'll normally charge you one fee to tear it down, bring it to us. We code it, take it back to them. And they put it back together. It's all one fee. And it's usually not that much. So, um, and that's been usually a, a pretty good um, you know, way around that for us. Let's see. Never been convicted. If somebody, some asshat said, have you ever been convicted? Yeah, I saw that. No, I have a law enforcement background, so convictions would be bad. <laughs> what are your thoughts on coating automatic knives and knife blades? Um, that's kind of like the disassembly thing. I mean, we do, we, we haven't done a lot of knives. We do them occasionally. And that kind of goes back on the, the person that you're doing it for. You just let them know that, hey, that edge is going to have Cerakote on it. And they're going to have to, you know, either put in an automatic sharpener or, or go back and, and remove that coating and then sharpen that edge. It's just, it is what it is. You know, it, this is not a factory process where, you know, we can go back and with a laser or whatever and, and blast that off. Um, automatic knives, I've never had one in here. I, I own a couple and I'd, I'd be terrified of taking those apart with expensive as they are. But you know, if, if we had one come in that was disassembled, I, I wouldn't have any trouble coating it. I mean, it's no big deal. It's just a part at that point. Let's see. Some info on your training. Laura took care of that. Um, Scott, I really have no idea. Um, I've never put acrylic over Cerakote. Um, if you want to email me some info on that and it's something we could do a video on, I mean, I, I've got no problem with trying stuff that's, you know, kind of outside the box just to, you know, have a, an idea for a video. I'm always looking for ideas for videos. So um, I've had some people request some crazy stuff that I thought was going to be just a train wreck and it ended up turning out kind of cool or was a train wreck. So you know, if you got something like that, send me as much info as you can. I'll be more than happy to knock a video out on it. Uh, Brad, if you want to just send Laura like just a sketch on a napkin, she can knock that stencil out for you, no problem. Hey, now. <laughs> um, Knife Pro, you want your, your Cerakote needs to be one mil or one, one to two mil, or it's just, um, you're not going to get the abrasion resistance. You may change the color, but you're not going to get any abrasion resistance at all. Um, and the thing with the Cerakote is it, it has to, go on the surface enough to to put down the layer and then it layers up on top of that basically that first layer is going to bond to the surface because what it does is it levels down into the etching you put on the sandblast cabinet that next layer bonds to that um and gives you your abrasion resistance so you you know you it's almost like a, even though it's all the same you know layer that you spray on all at the same time the thickness of it is what determines whether it's going to be durable or not so it's kind of that first part of that um 
pass that you sprayed is going to bond to the surface. The second part of that's going to give it its abrasion resistance because it's thick enough that it's not going to scratch through. Let's see. Yeah, that, that disassembly thing, we did it for a while and I would spend a half a day driving around. I'd get something in that I just could not figure out. There wasn't a YouTube video or anything. I'd spend a half a day driving around trying to find a gunsmith to put something back together that, you know, I charged a $50 bench fee. They charged me the 50 bucks and I was out half a day of work time. Um, it just really got to a point where it, it made no sense for us to do it anymore. And and we just had to kind of, like I said, it was, uh, there was some anxiety with it of, is this going to cost us business? And it really, it was no big deal at all, um, you know, once we did it. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I, I was in law enforcement for 13 years and I got hurt on duty and had to retire and was driving my wife crazy. So I got into Cerakote. Hey, now. <laughs> um, the laser, the the fiber laser especially, is probably some of the best money that we've ever spent on our business. It, it makes you chunks of money with zero physical effort really uh, very quickly. It doesn't sit there and run all day long, at least at this point for us. Um, but when it makes money, it's very quick and it's it's easy, um, especially once the design work is done and you can repeat that on the same type of item going forward. Or if you get somebody that sends you 20 of something that they want the same uh, you know NFA engraving on, um, it's very good money. It's, it's expensive. It was about $15,000 to get our fiber laser, but that included the training um, and the laser. So, you know, by the time we came back to the shop, um, it had all the, a lot of the settings preset in it. Um, we were up and running almost immediately. There were some learning things and some things we had to get over as far as putting, you know, putting something in there and going, oh my God, if this doesn't work, um, you know, we're buying somebody a slide or something. But after you kind of get comfortable with it, it it's definitely worth, um, you know, the money. It's, it's a big expense, but, uh, you know, if you're in that position to expand, it's definitely worth it. All right. Um, we do classes every other week, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Right now, we're kind of booked out till August. We've got, I think, one date left in August and then September's uh, wide open and everything after that. Um, and we're looking to add a third class. Yeah, and we're, we're talking about because we are starting to get to that point where we're three or four months out, and I don't want to get to the point where we're, people are getting put off. Um, so we're talking about maybe adding a third class and maybe cutting back on some of the smaller projects we take in, um, you know, and, and doing a third class every month. We, we have some employees, and, and we're going to try and work them into helping with the training a little more. Um, you know, it would still be primarily done by me, but maybe have them help with some of the grunt work um, that just – completely wastes me. Um, you know, it takes me a couple of days to recover for some, some training because it's just constant motion all day long for three days. Um, but we're, we're talking about adding that in there if there's interest and, in, you know, if there's not, then we'll, we'll have a week when we can work on stuff. So we're hopefully going to get that done. Uh, you know, we just talked about that today. So we'll, we'll have some info out on that probably in the next week or so. Um, you do not get factory certified where our training program is not cert, uh, affiliated with Cerakote at all. Um, you know, we could certify you as, as, you know, being Branson Cerakot certified. I don't know how much weight that would carry with anything. Um, and we've actually talked about that of coming up with like a checklist. And if at the end, you know, people meet a certain criteria that we feel comfortable saying, you know, we'll certify you. But in the end, I mean, it really doesn't do anything. What's going to certify you is your work. Um, you know, if you leave here and you go back and you apply that and you practice, you know, as much as you can, and you put out a quality product, you, you really don't need any certification. You know, the, like we talked about earlier, the factory certification will bring business in just because there are people that will look for that. Um, but other than that, I mean, the, the Internet and social media is going to bring in business just because people are going to see what you do and they're going to want you to repeat that for them or do something else. So, you know, uploading photographs and all that stuff in social media. I've told everybody that has come to our training, they need to start a YouTube channel. You know, this YouTube channel, we don't really make any money off of it, but it has physically, it has doubled our business as far as the amount of projects and things we have coming in um, since we started it three years ago. So, um, but out of the 200 people plus people have come, no one has started a YouTube channel. So, um, you know, there's a lot of 
things that your business has to start small or it's just not going to be uh, viable, but you grow it in a certain way. And, and, you know, before you know it, it's, it's actually, you know, turns into a 60 hour a week hell that you can't escape. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, it's, it's actually really enjoyable. I mean, uh, I, I enjoy doing this. I mean, I absolutely hate sandblasting, but I, I thoroughly enjoy Sarah coding. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really fun job. All right. Um, okay. Yes, yeah, Scott, just send me the info and we'll, we'll be happy to take a look at it. Um, ideal temperature range. Um, if you're doing anything polymer or uh, anything wood, electronics, or uh, like optics, red dots, scopes, whatever, um, 150 for two hours. If you're doing any kind of plastics, polymer or plastic, uh, 180 for two hours. The Generally, what I tell people with plastics and polymers is if you can flex it, if you can squeeze it and it bends, you want to really think twice about even doing it at all or doing it at 150. But if it's stiff enough that you can't flex it, then 180 for two hours is going to be fine. Um, and then any metals, you, you're good to go at 250 for two hours. You're not going to have any scorching problems or browning. Um, one big thing on, on things browning also is your oven really does have to have a circulating fan. Because what happens is that heat pulls at the top and that end of your project that's hanging closest to the top will actually brown up because that heat has pulled up there and it's not moving around. So just some kind of simple fan that circulates that air around is, is really important also. Um, there used to be, um, you know, ATF, there, there used to be a list of that and they took it off their website. I don't know why. So um, uh, general rule of thumb is anything like a lighter color, the dark colors, the blacks and grays and things like that and earth tones, you're probably good to go. But any of the lighter stuff, just stay away from it because it'll it'll definitely change colors on you. Um, I don't bake anything at 300 except for the elite series um, and the micro slick. The micro slick has to be baked at 300 if you use the uh, 109. Um, I just I, I've just gotten to the point where I'm, I'm tired of redoing stuff because, um, you know, it, oh, here's a new color they came out with and I tested it 300 and it doesn't turn out. So, you know, to me, um, most of the hard baking that we do is at the end of the day anyway. Um, I'll, I'll just run the oven at 250 and let it go. Um, it, to me, it's just not that big of a deal. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I bake most everything at 250. Um, a lot of times what happens with like the, the Magpul furniture and things, um, is that that's a dyed polymer and you're spraying a colored coating on top of it. So a lot of times you'll get customers, they'll say, well, I have Magpul OD furniture, I have Magpul flat dark earth furniture, and I want, you know, the rest of the gun to match that. The only way, what I tell the customer, the only way you're going to get to match is if you bring me those parts also, and we spray them all with the same batch. Um, because it's just not going to match a hundred percent. It'll be close, but it's not going to be a hundred percent match. Um, there are so many little tiny variations in the way, you know, a gram or two of hardener difference or, you know, the, the temperature of the oven or humidity, all these different things, um, that it's just not going to be a hundred percent match. So, you know, to me, that would be important if it was my gun, I'd want it to match. So I just tell them to spray the whole thing and we'll spray it all. You know, if that's the color they like, we'll just spray it that color and it'll all match. Let's see. Uh, yes, the 12 to 1 ratio, Matthew, the 12 to 1 ratio will prevent those scuff marks. Um, I And I don't know why they give, you know, kind of tell people those ratios when when that's kind of a, a, a potential result. I was getting those and it was driving me crazy. And when I went out there and asked them that question and, and got the answer I did, it just didn't make any sense to me why, you know, they would tell people to do that. But we only do 12 to 1. Um, and, and honestly, it, it it's just never really been an issue um, since then. And it's not an issue with the customers either. So let's see. Oh, absolutely. Um, you got to sometimes work hard to get a, a nice turd brown color. Um, but if you can get, knock that out in an hour with a 300, then absolutely. That's the way to do it.
Well, there you go. Final accuracy. I mean, that this is not a bad uh, gig. I mean, honestly, especially if you know, you've got some health issues. I've, um, you know, when I retired, I've, I've got a bad neck, a bad back. I got bad, one bad knee. Um, so it is kind of nice that, you know, when you get up for the day and, you know, I, I tell people I work for myself. So if I get up on a Tuesday and I decide, nah, not today, I just sit in my chair and watch TV all day and I'll make it up on Saturday. So it is kind of nice to be able to make your own schedule. Um, the flip side of that is you, you're responsible for everything. Um, so there are times when the little tiny things that you have to deal with get you know kind of great on you a little bit. But um, I honestly, after having worked for myself for the last six and a half years, I don't think I could ever go back to a job where I've worked for someone else. Although I guess I do work for Laura, at least she thinks so. All right. Yeah, definitely, Laura. My my. When I got into this, I thought ah, twenty hours a week. I'll make some gun money. I'll be able to buy some, you know, stuff I've been wanting to buy. And sixty hours a week later, it's it's somehow turned into a business. Uh, HRE series. Um, Joseph, the, the difference between H and E is is kind of what you're going to do with it. Um, you know, E, you really can't, and I've heard, uh, there's probably going to be an argument, but I've heard people say you can stencil with a, uh, E series and you can tack it. When I, they first came out with it, they said no. And I've kind of just stuck with that because to me, I, I don't need to do it with that. Um, E series is the better coding. However, it does have limited applications. So if you want to do, uh, you know, camo and things like that, H, even if you could tack and, and stencil with E, there's not that many colors and H series is much easier to work with. So that's the, the place for, for H series. Um, real quick to throw in C series. I have not sprayed C series in probably three and a half years. Uh, don't like it. It's not very durable. Uh, you got to wait forever to, for it to dry. Um, and then you peel it all off and figure out you got a problem, have sand it all off anyway, and you've wasted a week. Just not worth it to me. Um, the um, E series is a really good product for, uh, you know, bolt carriers or bolt rifle, uh, you know, bolts or barrels where you just need a solid color on a, a you know, a barrel that that's a better product because the other problem with H series on like a barrel or a, a bolt carrier or a bolt or something is, um, it's only good to, uh, it's, it's the heat resistance of it's not very good. It's not nearly as good as the elite series. So it's kind of one of those, you, you can put the two different projects together. You can do the barrel in, in elite and the rest of the gun in H. It's not going to be a big deal, but um, I've also not really had an issue with uh, the H series um, changing colors if they wanted a camo barrel to match the rest of the gun type of thing. You know, you just talk to your customer and just, are you going to shoot suppressed? You're going to shoot full auto. If those answers are no, then you generally won't have to worry about, um, you know, H series discoloring on a barrel from heating up too much um, unless there's some three gun, you know, shooter or something like that. And then you just have that conversation. But it's just a matter of asking questions and, and seeing, you know, leaving the, the decision up to them, you know, explain to them this could potentially happen. What would you like to do and explain the limitations of, well, no, OK, well, I want elite, but I want purple. Well, they don't have purple. So, you know, what would you like to do? Well, then I'll take a chance on H. Well, great. You know, and if it changed color later, you know, you hate to be that way, but you're a business person that that's on them. That's not on you. You explain to them they made the decision, you know, that's out of your hands. So. Um, but yeah, if, if the a E series, you could do everything you could do with H series, uh, with E I'd use E exclusively. I wouldn't even touch H series because it is such a, a really good product. Um, same thing, like I said, with the C series, I, I just do not use C series. Um, I hate it. Haven't used it in years. Don't stock it. Don't like it. Um, to me, if I need something for high temperature, I'll use the elite series. Scott, this is a great business to get into. If, if it's something you're really serious about, um, shoot me a phone call one evening when we're kind of closed up. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Yes, we, we pay Andrew to sandblast because I absolutely hate sandblasting. So do I. And I could not threaten my 14-year-old into doing it permanently. Uh, do you think that a San Antonio laser is the same as an import that charge a lot for the laser system? It looks like um, it, it it is. I would say it's probably the same laser as the other ones that you see that are kind of that you know uh, seven shape with the, the head on the end. the The advantage to going with San Antonio though is 
you get the training and you get all the presets, you get customer support that you're not going to get from China. And you also get put into a closed Facebook group where you can get on there and say, does anyone have the setting for this? And someone is going to chime up and say, do this or, oh my God, don't do that project. That's horrible. It's never going to turn out. Um, someone's going to give you that information. So just the support you get for that laser is going to be worth the, the money to go down there and do it. You know, if you could get that same laser for what they charge you, the, the $7,500 or so, but not the training, the training is what you're paying that money for. The laser is just the tool. Um, but the knowledge that you're going to get from that five days of going down there and the customer support and everything else later, that's going to be the big part of what you're spending that money on. It is definitely not something that you're going to start a Cerakote business and, you know, six weeks later, you're like, all right, let's get into lasers too, um, unless you've got some huge revenue stream. But down the road, once you're established, the, the, that laser is going to allow you to do a lot of things. Um, having said that, the laser is only going to uh, engrave metal and do polymer. It does not do wood. It does not do, uh, you know, plastics, um, you know, other than the polymer. It doesn't do plastics. It doesn't do wood. It doesn't do um, you know, etching, it, it'll do etching, but it doesn't like to because it, it really wants to get after it. So, but it has, you know, settings in there to just blow off one layer of Cerakote. It has preset to do Glock stippling where you don't have to wonder, okay, is it too powerful? Am I going fast enough? It's got a setting in there that says Glock stipple and you hit the button and it stipples a Glock. So, you know, you, once you get your pattern set up, you don't have to wonder if I'm getting this right. Am I going to set this Glock on fire? Um, if you want to do uh, magazines, 30 round PMAGs, it's got a setting in there for that. So it's got a lot of preset things, you know, NFA engraving, it's already in there. So, you know, there's a value to all of that. And so if I was going to, you know, buy, an, uh, if I was going to get into fiber lasers tomorrow and, and had done my research, I would still do it the same way. There's not another company that I found that I would go out there and, and do. Now, CO2 side, which does pretty much everything that the fiber won't do, um, I would go with the one that we just bought, that uh, the Helix, um, epilogue. the Epilogue Helix. It, it it was very expensive. It was more expensive than the fiber. However, the cheap Chinese one we had before that had so many issues and, and has zero training, zero anything. Um, you know, the Epilogue is almost like running a printer. You, you just tell it what you want to do, hit the button and, and you're off and running. So, you know, if you want to get into the laser side of it, it's a good idea to, to have both capabilities, but it's very expensive to get into. Um, but it does make you money. It's just you got to have that capability and that the means to do it. All right. Uh, weight versus volume. Um, when I first got into this, it was all volume. There was no option to do weight. And I've just gotten I'm, I'm comfortable doing it by volume. Um, the other thing that I look at is if I open my fridge and I've got a thousand dollars worth of coating in there, I didn't pay for any of it. Um, it's all paid for by customers. So if I dump out three mil at the end of it, I don't care. Um, to me, to not have to sit down or worry about, um, you know, five grams of black is a different ratio than five grams of satin aluminum with all the flake in it. I'm old. I don't have time to deal with all that. I just mix it up 12 to one and off and run it. Um, again, it goes kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier, where time is what is going to cost you money. Uh, time is what's going to make you money. So to me, uh, it's not worth it uh, to, to worry about weights and, and all that stuff. Um, and I know there are apps out there, but again, I'm old. So no, I do it all by volume. Ah, oh, the shock by the blast cabinet. <laughs> Oh, I got a story about that one. So I had never done anything like this. I was always, a, I was in the, the army and then I got, that was a cop and I got hurt. So I'd never sprayed, never other than shop class uh, in high school, never really messed around with any of this stuff. So I've been doing this maybe about three or four weeks and I kept getting zapped inside my elbows. And it felt like, I tell everybody, it felt like someone took a big rubber band and just popped you right inside your elbows. And I was getting mad. I'm like, what the hell? So I go to the internet and they're like, oh yeah, you need to ground your, uh, you know, the nozzle on your, your spray, your uh, sandblast cabinet. I'm like, oh my God, that's so simple. So the company I bought mine from TP tools, um, on their website has the grounding kit. It's nothing super science. It's just an alligator clip with a wire that bolts right to the gun. Uh, that's all you need to do is just ground your, your actual nozzle to the deck of your cabinet and that'll take care of your, your, uh, get zapped. Um, if you've got the same one I got, it's worth the like 18 bucks to just get the kit that's already set up. And all you got to do is it takes you five minutes to put it in. 
Now uh, let's see. Um, we've only really done a couple of, um, this is for Steven. We've only done a couple of projects with the 5100. Um, it sprays really nice. Um, crank it up to 30, uh, 30 PSI. Open your fan up as wide as it'll go and create a volume where you get just a big cloud. Not really, um, you know, you don't want to spray it directly on. You don't want to be that, you know, like six inches away type of thing where you're, the air pressure is throwing it directly on. What you want is to be a little further back, about 18 inches, where it's kind of just throwing a cloud out into the air, and that cloud is falling on there. It'll give you a much smoother finish. Um, trying to miss something on here. Oh, um, make sure you strain it and all that good stuff. But any, other than that, it, it's actually a really easy product to, to deal with. It is an air cure, so it's going to have to get set aside. You, you want to kind of keep it in a, a, a relatively dust-free area. Um, you know, you don't want a bunch of lint and crap floating around the air that's going to land on it while it's still wet um, for at least the first four to six hours. Once it's tacked out, um, it's not durable yet. If you bump it, it's going to leave a mar, but um, you know, you won't have to worry about stuff sticking to it. Just set off the side, let it dry a little bit. And after three or four days, um, you know, it's, it'll be hard enough that you want to worry about it. I, when it comes to clear coat, I don't give the, the, the project back to the customer until it's had a full seven days. And the reason why is, you know, people get excited about getting the projects back and you'll tell them, OK, this has only been three days. It feels dry, but it's not really all the way set. Give it another four days before you you know, drink out of this cup or put this back together. And inevitably people will go, well, it feels good enough to me and they'll do it. Um, I had the biggest problem with probably tumblers and then it clouds up because it gets wet and they go, oh, can you fix this? Well, no, there's no fixing it. We, you got to buy another cup. So what I've done is just take that out of the equation. I just keep it for seven days and then here you go. So just keep that in mind that it's got to have a full pretty much seven days. Um, let's see. Uh, Venture Designs, I'm, I'm pretty informal. You can just call me John. Or Supreme Commander. Or Supreme Commander. That's why I make the kids call me. <laughs> oh. Uh, what can I do? E series one X R versus H. Um, the E series, and, and I've heard all this conflicting information, but I've really never gotten a, a, a solid answer on, you know, whether or not you can tack it. In my experience, it doesn't really go from a wet to tacky to dry. It goes from wet to hard. Um, and I've never really experimented with it because when they first came out, they said you were one and done. You sprayed it, you baked it, it was done. Um, so, and as far as what makes it harder, I don't know. It's just a different compound, a different, you know, chemical mixture. Um, but it is a better product. I mean, you can even feel it once you've sprayed H and Elite on something. If you sprayed them on two different identical parts and you feel it, it feels different. Um, and it is just a much better product, but it only comes in like 11 colors and, you know, the fact that you can't really stencil with it. I would be leery of trying to tack it because, again, the problem with Cerakote, and, I, and I've ran into this yesterday with a question I got. Um, somebody called me with a question was, um, you know, if you spray your base coat on um, and you air cure it, put it in the oven, you bake it all the way hard and you spray more Cerakote on there, it's more likely going to flake off because you have to tack in between layers. You can't hard bake it and then put more on there. Uh, because Cerakote won't stick to hard baked Cerakote. So it's kind of the same thing with the Elite. You know, is it going to go through that? You know, how much of a window do you have there where maybe it's still soft enough you can put more on uh, versus it got too hard and it's not going to be a, a good product? So I would much rather just stay in that safe zone versus going, ah, it's probably good enough and then sending a, a customer project out there that they may have spent thousands of dollars on and now they trash me on Facebook and I lose business over that. So to me, it's not worth venturing into an area I don't need to venture into. Um, you know, everything has its place in that, that little circuit world, but, um, you know, you just don't want to, I don't know. I, I personally don't want to venture into an area that I just don't need to, I guess. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brad, um, I'm sorry. Laura's over there shaking her head. Yes, I am old. Um, that's not what I said. Read my comments. Oh yeah. And, and then right below she hedges her bet. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Really tall. I keep getting shocked at my nipples. Oh, my goodness. 
you're not the first person that has said that. And I, maybe I'm lucky I'm short. Um, yeah, you just need to ground your, your nozzle. Um, and like I said, that kit, there's probably all kinds of videos and stuff. If you've got a TP tools uh, cabinet, like I said, they sell the kit. It's worth worth every bit of the money that you can spend on it. Um, but strangely enough, you're not the first person that's told me their nipples get shocked. Um, we'll stay away from piercings and things like that. But um, All right. Uh, oh, Laura, really? How crude are you? Um... Benjamin, what are you talking about? Uh, acetone, the final, final layer to get the heavy spray out. Maybe he means the edges. Um, if you're talking about the edges, no, there's no way to get those edges off um, other than just not spray heavy. Um, you've got to spray those extra, uh, the extra layers after your base coat have to be really light, um, just heavy enough to, to cover up what's underneath. Um, the other thing you can do as far as camo, and, and this is mainly what we do with um, like multicam, there's, there's two ways you can do multicam, um, and I'll, I'll kind of explain those real quick since it seems like we're, we're slowing down just a little. So traditional multicam, you'll put your base coat on, air cure, tack, let it cool, lay a few stencil pieces on, spray another color, air cure, air cure tack, bring it out, let it cool, lay more stencil pieces on. So then you go back to your sandblast cabinet and at very low pressure, sandblast in between as much as you can your stencil pieces. So you want to knock back everything that's not covered by a stencil back down to as, as best you can back down to the bare surface. That's going to take a lot of that ridge away uh, before it gets started type of thing. So get it out, blow it off with high pressure air, spray your next two colors blended with one, tack it, bring it out, spray the next one, blend them, and then you put more pieces on, spray another color, lay pieces on, and your final color goes over that. And you shouldn't, you should not, or should hopefully not have ridges. Now that's traditional multicam. The way we do it, and then the conversation I have with my customers is, you know, they'll come in and say, "Well, I want traditional multicam," and I always ask them, "Well, you know, explain to me why you want traditional multicam because you can get traditional multicam from the manufacturers a lot of times. Uh, you know, there there's thousands of traditional multicam guns out there. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take that same five colors, take four of them, blend those together on the surface, then lay the pieces on, then spray one final color over that to give definition to the pieces. And then when you peel that piece, you get three or four or five colors in that piece. So that's a lot more custom, but it's still multicam. So, you know, in that way, you, you never have ridges. So, you know, it's just different ways to do things. And a lot of this is just experimenting and, and trying things. You know, the other thing I tell people that come to our training is, you know, get an old beat up handguard or something, you know, a part you don't care about anymore. And when you're going to dump coating out, spray it on something, tack it out and just leave it hanging on a rack. And then when you've got some extra coating, throw a couple stencil pieces on, spray that on there and just practice some of these techniques of not getting ridges or blending and then put stencil pieces on. Just see what works together and what looks good together. And then you you file that away and go forward. You know, it's it's a lot of this is me having six and a half years of doing this and trying a lot of this stuff. So, you know, it's you just got to be willing to just try this stuff and see what works, what doesn't. I mean, you'll find plenty of stuff that doesn't work that you're like, all right, file that away. Don't ever do that again. Um, but you'll find a lot of stuff that works, that does work and you'll come up with a cool technique. Now, let's see. Um, we, we have had some, some contact from, you know, some large manufacturers. Um, the, the one that we're just finishing up was uh, is, is a really big contract for us. Um, I, I can't give a lot of information, but it's it's from a, a very large uh, outdoor company. Um, we have had contact from a, a fairly large uh, firearm manufacturer that wants us to do some custom work for them. So, you know, a lot of that is you know getting your name out there and doing some stuff that people see and you know then they they you know have the interest in even doing business with you so uh, you know a lot of this is what i tell people is you know one of the things we tell people in training is you know buy yourself a carcass it could be nothing but just a, a you know polymer lower you can get for dirt cheap a crappy upper that you may have laying around and a chinese hand guard off of ebay and sand that stupid thing down and coat it 50 times and take pictures of it every time you coat it and do some crazy stuff with it that you'd never do on your own gun or a customer's never going to let you do on your, on, on theirs. But that lets you then take that thing out, lean it against a cool tree. Don't lay it in your broke concrete driveway or, 
you know, on your bench with a bunch of you know crumbs from lunch on it and take a really nice sunlight, you know, drenched in sunlight picture and upload that. Put it on Instagram, put it on your Facebook page, put it on your website. The more you get that stuff out there, the more interest you're going to get from these larger, um, you know, companies and things like that. And, and you'll never you, you'll never know when that stuff's going to hit. We've had you know six months where we never got contacted by anybody to do anything big. And then we've gotten two within two weeks. Um, and you're scrambling around trying to get it all done. So it just never know. But a lot of it is just building your reputation up and things like that. Uh, but a lot of that goes back to you know putting a quality project out too. You know you've get you've got to do really good quality work and and you know be consistent, be honest with people, and you know blah blah blah. So all right, let's see. Um, I'm assuming you mean like uh, best temperature for as far as like uh, spraying it. Um, we generally keep our shop in the you know 60 to 75 degree range, um, and it does fine. If you refrigerate your coating like we do, um, you want to take it out you know a couple hours before you spray, let it come up to room temp. As long as it's room temp from what you're spraying, um, then you're going to be fine. I mean, even if it's a little colder or a little warmer, um, you're going to be good to go. If it's warmer, if it's in the 80s in your shop, then it's the problem you're going to run into is if it's sitting in the gun for that, you know, you got about 45 minutes, you're probably going to have about 30 minutes. So it's going to cut down on the amount of time that you've got that it, your batch is actually good for. Um, but other than that, it's it's usually, you know, not a, a huge deal as far as as long as it's just a normal, comfortable temperature. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, you don't want to spray an item that is hot. So I, I get that question quite a bit, too, where. You know, if I took something out of the oven, can I just take it straight to the booth and spray it? No, because what's going to happen is you're going to flash cure your um, your coating onto that surface. And, and the two downsides of that is it's not going to have time to level. And you're also going to flash cure your solvent onto your surface. So you're going to have these weird kind of wavy, shiny areas. So you, you definitely don't want to do that. All right. Um, tolerance issues, 1911s are really about the only ones that, that you're going to have, you know, really bad tolerance issues with. Um, and it doesn't matter how you spray them. They're going to need a little bit of work to get them back together to get the slide back on the frame. That's just a conversation that you have with your customer and let them know that, Hey, this is going to be the issue and you're going to have, to, they're going to have to just deal with it. Um, you know, you, you, the other thing I tell every customer is, your gun's never going to be as dry as it is when you pick it up from me. It doesn't even come from the manufacturer as dry as it is right now. Um, you got to oil it because you get people go, I don't understand why this is going. Well, did you oil it? Well, no, I didn't oil it. Well, dude, I mean, come on now, help me. Um, you know, so 1911s are really about the only ones that I've ever had tolerance issues with. Um, and you just let them know, look, you're going to have to work that thing. You have to oil the heck out of it. And you're going to have to keep working it, working it, working it. And eventually it'll, you know, cycle and you go shoot it a few times, you're going to be good to go. So those are really about the only ones. Um, if it didn't function right after you did it, then um, my only thought was maybe you, you got a little heavy somewhere um, down where like the internals uh, sit, maybe that um, the sear disconnect or something like that. Um, you know, and that happens. So, you know, you may need to just tear it back down and redo it. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Scott, absolutely. I mean, as long as, you know, you, you don't want to do ones that are, um, you know, have electronics in them. Um, I've never tried one of those. The only thing that I would recommend on that is as soon as you get the money to start upgrading to, you know, like ARs and things like that, especially as cheap as you can usually uh, round those up, you want to do that because, you know, someone that's going to give you their $1,000 or $2,000 AR is not going to want to judge what you can do off of an airsoft gun. Um, they're going to want to at least see that you can do you know, they want to see samples of real guns. I mean, people are really protective of, you know, their guns. That's, you know, I won't call them their baby, but because um, nobody puts baby in a corner. But, you know, it's people are protective and they're, they're particular about who gets to take their guns. It's like, you know, taking your car. You know, you're not going to just let anybody run off with your car and do something to it. So um, that would be my, my recommendation is that that's not a bad thing to start off with. Um, but you want to upgrade as quickly as you can, especially if you're going to do gun shows. If nothing else, just buy chassis, you know, upper, lower handguard, 
Um, you can generally get those in the $400 range and coat those, clear coat of them so, so they last at the gun shows and then take them and don't sell them. Um, do some cool stuff, do some stuff that's a little outlandish that's going to draw attention. Uh, buy some decent stands or make some decent stands that look really nice. Um, buy some table covers that look nice and set those things out and, and, and people will come up and, and want to talk to you about it just because they're interesting. Um, but yeah, that's a good idea. Let's see. Uh, Joseph, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I got a little ahead of myself. So you would spray your base coat, air cure it, which uh, again is one of those steps that gets skipped a lot um, for eight to 10 minutes. Then you put it in the oven, get it tacked out. So you go from that wet zone to sticky to dry. As soon as it's dry, yank it out um, and let it cool. So then you would go in your next color. So what I generally will do is if I'm going to do a like a four color blend, I'll spray everything one one base color. Everything gets base coated. So I'll spray that, put it all through the cycle, get it tacked out, bring out, let it cool. Then I'll mix up. And it, that may take 60, 72 mil to do that. So everything from there is probably only going to be about 12 mil a batch because you really just don't need as much. So I'll mix up 12 mil. I'll mock the gun up. So I'll put nylon pins in where or uh, plugs in where the takedown pins go. I'll plug the selector switch hole, things like that. I'll put the handguard on uh, the barrel nut. So that's all lined up to where I, you know, your pattern will have some, some flow to it. So at that point, you hang it back in the booth and you'll dial the cone all the way closed on your, your uh, spray gun and then set your volume up to be not super heavy, but enough that you can kind of get a good, you know, color out of it. And then you just kind of blotch just all over the thing. Um, and just kind of divide, you want to divide visually or mentally divide the gun up into fours, uh, but not like four, you know, one, 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 one. You want to divide it up into so that at the end of it, you've got um, about a fourth of the gun all over is each color. So you spray that color, air cure, tack, bring it out, let it cool, go back, spray the next color and do that till you got all four colors on and they're tacked, bring it out. Then you lay your stencils on. Spray your solid color over that to give definition to your pieces. Air cure, tack. And then what I do is I don't bake it all the way with the stencils on. You can do that as long as you let it, when you bring it out of the oven, you let it cool all the way down to room temp before you peel them so you don't get adhesive uh, transfer. But what I do is I just tack it out that final time, pull it out, peel the stencils off. I do that for two reasons. One, you don't get adhesive transfer. And two, uh, you see if you have any issues. If you've got an issue where you've got to redo it, you might as well have to redo it when it's soft baked. It's just tacked out and it'll sandblast right off versus you baked it for two hours at 250. Now it's hard and you got to sit there and just grind it off. Basically, you know, it takes forever to sandblast it off. So, um, you know, that's why I do it that way. But yeah, you, you tack it in between every one so that you don't, you know, spray blue and red and you end up with a purple, you know, swipe down the middle where they mix because they, they will mix if they're wet. So no, you do tack it out in between. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, the boat anchor, that thing, little uh, high point polymer, best forty dollars ever spent on a handgun. Uh, P eighty frame done that they finished themselves. Um, as far as doing P eighties and um, you know, like the eighty percent lowers, that depends on which. ATF IOI you talk to, and it depends on locale, uh, you know, where you're at, where I'm at and my IOI, they've, they've told me they're fine. Uh, you know, as long as you're taking that from the owner and you're returning it to the owner, they're good to go. Um, it doesn't matter if it's milled or not milled. Um, now what they've told me was log that in your book. Um, and under the serial number, you just put NVS for no visible serial number. Um, and then you can return that right back to them because you're not transferring that. It's not a transfer of ownership. You're doing work on it. So that's one of those areas where it's, it's kind of a gray area. But I think as long as you're following, you, your intent is to do the right thing. I don't think you're going to have any huge issues. And, and honestly, I don't think you're violating the law by doing that. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. I don't do one on YouTube. So do your own research on that. But that's how I operate. That, that's the information I've had. That's how I operate with that. Um, you know, same thing with the P80 frames. Uh, it, you know, we've put serial numbers on those where people have milled them out, um, had them complete handguns. They bring them in and we, we laser etch the serial numbers on them. So 
Um, you know, if you can do that, I don't see any reason why you, if you can put a serial number on, I don't see any reason why you couldn't seracode it. Um, you know, just like, uh, you know, if, if someone drops their gun off and says, well, I'm going to be leaving the country for six weeks, um, my son's going to pick it up. Well, that's great. Your son can pick it up, but I have to transfer that gun to him. He now owns your gun or you just wait till you get back and you can come get it. Um, same thing with these, you know, the 80%. So if they drop it off, they have to pick it up. They can't send their wife to pick it up or anything like that. Um, they are the sole owner of that that weapon. They have to be the one to pick it up. Uh, uh, Carl, if you do not air cure, here's here's what happens when you air cure before baking. So when you spray this stuff, it you're you're spraying the coating and you're spraying the uh, the solvent. So when you air cure it, it does two things. One, the solvent evaporates out. So if you just go straight to the oven, you bake that solvent into your coating, and you end up with these weird kind of shiny areas and they're permanent. Um, the other thing that happens is once that solvent's gone, that coating actually levels down into that etching you put on in the sandblast cabinet. So that step of air curing is, is huge for durability and appearance. It's probably one of the most important steps. So eight to 10 minutes, um, you know, on the low end, 25 to 30 minutes on the high end, if you're doing a, a, a really big project, I would generally say if you're you're getting to the point where you're 25 parts into a project and it's it's been 30 minutes. Just set a separate timer for your follow on parts after that and get those in the oven. Um, and you just run two separate batches because what will happen is in your next step, you're going to put most of those parts together anyway. Um, and you're going to go from maybe 50 parts down to 20. Um, and then you're not going to have to do that. So it'll be the first time you do it anyway. Um, but yeah, that air cure is a huge important step. And it's really, I mean, the last time I looked at the pamphlet, it's like one sentence in there that says to do it, but they don't explain to you why it's so important. Um, but, and that also relates to why you only really have two options on uh, sandblast abrasive is because that's a specific etch pattern that you need in your surface. And that's, you're only going to get that from those two blast medias, but that's why is when that stuff levels, it levels down in there and it's chemically designed to bond to that etch pattern. So that, that's a really important step. All right. Um, Um, so as far as gun, the gun candy goes, the way I did it and, um, got a little grief on getting my bottles from REI, but I'm a business person. I get them where I can get them cheap. Um, buy four ounce Nalgene bottles. They're, they're polypropylene. So they stand up to the, the, uh, clear coat. The cool thing about those, those small bottles, it's the same ones that Cerakote uses to ship their stuff in is get a strainer, strain your, your high gloss into that bottle. Well, as soon as it shoulders, when it starts to go up and over that curved area, that's four ounces. So visually, you know, that's the four ounce mark. So once you get that point, you never strain it again. If you strain it into your gun, once you've added the gun candy, you're going to strain out most of your gun candy. So you, you, you basically get your bottle, pour some uh, clear coat in there, throw a strainer, throw a strainer away. Now that bottle is going to be that color gun candy until you use it all. Now, the nice thing about using uh, air cure gun candy or uh, clear coat is, Whatever gun candy you did spray, you pour right back in the bottle and you're good to go. Um, you never want to shake clear coat because if you shake it, you'll oxygenate it. You'll shake bubbles into it. You'll spray it on your surface. It'll look nice and smooth. And it won't look like there's any issues. And then two, three hours later, you go check and you'll have hard bubbles all over it where that, that, those, uh, that air that you shook into it has started to come to the surface and now hardened. Um, so you never want to shake clear coat. Um, if you've got matte clear or you've got gun candy, what you want to do is just lay your bottle on a bench top and just roll it back and forth. And that will reincorporate that matte clear, that goo at the bottom that makes it matte or the gun candy. Um, so the gun candy, you know, once you get it reincorporated and you can turn the bottle upside down, and if there's not a bunch of goo stuck to the bottom, then you're good to go. Um, pour it in the gun. You want to spray it at 30 PSI. And with gun candy, you want to spray one or two light passes. So really quick passes from 12 inches or so back. Um, generally what I tell people is if you sprayed a couple of passes and you think, oh, just one more pass, stop. Don't do it because that one more pass is going to be the one that's going to make it run. Um, you know, it's that, that flake has weight to it. And if you do too much, it starts to sag and it's, you just ruin your project and start over. So, um, but you know, it's, th that's an easy way to do it. And I just write the color on there with a Sharpie. 
Um, and like I said, whatever you don't use, because you're not using a whole lot, um, especially for like a tumbler or something, you just pour the rest of it back in there, flush your cheap gun out with acetone. I don't ever spray any kind of clear coat through my Awadas. Um, I use just cheap guns. Um, you just flush it out and then go right on about your business. So, all right. Uh, yeah, I'll let Laura answer, answer Scott's question there. I don't do um, anything. Yeah, I don't do anything design wise. Um, if I go in there and I touch, we, we have um, three commercial stencil cutters for our stencil side of the business. If I go in there and I do anything, I've, I've started learning a little bit about them. Um, but if I go in there and touch them, I screw up all kinds of settings. And I get yelled at. So I just I leave that side of it alone other than getting up at 4.30 in the morning and stuffing stuff into envelopes and putting them in the mailbox. Uh, um, after it bakes and cools, there's nothing else you need to do. Um, when it comes out of the oven, it's as hard as it's ever going to be. Um, if you want to add that one little extra layer or it's kind of flat looking and you want to add a little bit to it, um, you can spray some matte clear over it. And it, what I tell my customers is if it's kind of flat looking and you put the matte clear on, it's going to give it almost like a regular factory looking finish as far as sheen goes. Um, so those are kind of your two options, but as soon as it comes out of the oven, it doesn't need to sit another couple of days. It's as hard as it's going to get. Let's see. I'm getting there. Um, there is no uh, FFL requirement to send you guns and to send them back to them. Um, with the caveat of, understand what state you're sending it to um, on the federal level there is no requirement because it's not a transfer of ownership they're sending it to you for basically gunsmithing work so they can send it directly to you you can send it directly back to them um, without an ffl requirement however you do have to have an ffl if you're charging people money to do serialized parts uh in serico you do have to have an ffl so um on your end you're covered um if you're shipping to some of the places on the left coast, then you are probably going to want to go with uh, send it to an FFL. I don't know. Um, we we have a, a few places that we just generally don't do business with um, because I don't want to um, do this type of job and I'm fine and this type of job and it's a felony and you know I got to worry about all that. So to me, it's for a little extra business. It's not worth the headache. Um, but as far as as long as there's not a transfer of ownership, you're not sending a gun to a buddy and it's now going to be his gun that was your gun, then yes, you need to do a transfer. But if he's sending you something for you to do work on and then sending it right back, there's, there's no requirement. Let's see. Hi, Romel. Hi, Romel. I answered Scott. Yeah. Um, do I ever use airbrushes? Um, we have a really nice airbrush. I use it maybe once every month or six weeks um, because I can do 90% of what I uh, would do with an airbrush with the Iwata by just doing the adjustments and things on it. Um, I would be very leery of doing um, the base coat with an airbrush just because of how narrow of a cone that you're going to spray with a, an airbrush. It would be really hard to get consistent uh, a consistent base coat all the way around, plus with um, how fine of a, a an instrument that is, it'd be hard, really hard to get the one mil consistently all the way around, like, you know, an AR handguard or something like that. Um, but they are good for, you know, just small detail work. If, you know, you want, you, you're doing the, the teeth on a jack lower or something like that. Um, I think that, you know, that would be pretty much you know, where I, I, I think you have the best use of it. Um, but I, I'd be very, very leery of using it for like the the only thing you used for the entire project. Um, the LPH 80 is probably the first item that we tell people that, you know, if you're going to, you have some available money to upgrade, that is the first thing you want to upgrade because that LPH 80 is going to give you the biggest kind of margin for error. And it's going to be the most forgiving piece of equipment that you're going to have. That's going to allow you to put out a quality project. Baby. Yep. Uh, I think we're probably going to wrap it up here pretty quick. I'll take a, we'll go about maybe five more minutes. I think we're done. Well, actually on that note, thank you, Knife Pro. I think we will probably wrap it up. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I seriously, when we talked about doing a live chat, I thought we'd get maybe two people 
and I'd be talking to myself more than anybody else. Um, so I appreciate everybody uh, popping in here. It, it is an easy way to put out a lot of information all at one time. And, um, you know, I appreciate the questions. So we're going to try and do these about every other week. Um, leave me some comments or, or shoot me a message on what, you know, days of the week or what time. This was just something we, you know, we, we were available. So, um you know, if you guys think like a Sunday evening at seven o'clock could be better or a Thursday at whatever, you know, let me know and, and we'll adjust as we can. Um, nice thing about working for myself is I'm, I'm pretty much able to set my own schedule. So again, thanks to everybody for logging in to help us get through this first one. And uh, we'll have another video coming out in a few days. And thanks for everybody uh, for watching. Bye. Don't forget to check us out at BransonSaracote.com for all your laser stencil and Saracote needs. Have a great day.